Welcome to Community CPA webinar. My name is Son and I will be hosting today webinar. And for today's topic, what we are gonna be talking about is gonna be what business owners should know about depreciation. If you're in a business, everybody should know about what is depreciation. And that will be the topic for today. First of all, I just want to introduce our CEO, Jin Sa. She is the managing partner of Community CPA, and she wrote a book. And the name of the book is Appointment with Jin at 8 a.m. And it's just a startup business book. So if you're not running your business or you don't know how to start or what to do, this one will be a good book for you. And I will strongly recommend you to get it. But if you already have a business and you want to grow it and you don't know what is the next step, then you should consider to buy her upcoming book. And it's coming soon. And that is appointment with Jing at 10 a.m. And that one is for you to grow your business. Like always, just want to put it out there or no responsibility disclaimer. The information that you are gonna be provided in this webinar do not and is not intended to constitute a legal advice. These are just information only. And if you are looking for legal advice, please consult you, counsel or lawyer. Okay, so we're gonna start today webinar. So the question is, what is depreciation? If you don't know what is depreciation, it's basically is a term that refers to the process of deducting either by decreasing or reducing in something that has value over its useful life. Um, normally depreciation is basically the cost of a business asset over a number of years to recover your basis in property that is used more than one year for the business or for income producing purpose. Technically, what it means is that if you have an asset, a property, uh, that asset um, has a life that is more than one year, then you can depreciate it over the year of that asset. So for example, if you buy equipment that normally have a, a useful life of five years, then you're gonna be depreciating, reducing the value of the cost of that asset over the life of that equipment, okay? Very simple term. So what asset? can be depreciated. No, every asset can be depreciated. So we have equipment, uh, for example, in the restaurants that will include the cooking appliances, freezers. Uh, we have machine in the construction uh, activity. In construction activity, you will find like uh, power tools or hand tools. Uh, we have vehicles, we have building, and we have what they call land improvement. Um, land by default is not depreciable. That means that you cannot reduce the value of the land because land, it doesn't have a life. It can last forever. Therefore, the land by itself cannot be depreciated, but the land improvement, I just listen carefully here because what I'm referring is the improvement. The improvement of the land can be depreciated. And what is the improvement? Um, improvement can be fence, can be um, driveway. It could be uh, landscaping. Anything that will improve the land. Basically, just the term land improvement. That is just the meaning of that. So what happens when you buy a property and that property has a land and has the building, how do you come up with the value of the land if you cannot depreciate the land? Well, the simple answer is that if you don't know what is the value of the land, then you can use the uh, government, govern, government assessor website. So on the property tax assessor website, normally will give you a breakdown of what is the value of the land 
and then what is the value of the building, the property itself. So you just come up with a percentage. And for example, if the land based on the government uh, assessor website said that the land is 25%, then you are gonna allocate 25% of the purchase price of the building to the land. And then the rest, 75%, which is which is the, the building, then you will be able to depreciate that. And keep in mind that today, when we are talking about depreciating items, we are referring to business items and only property that, property that you use for the business. If you buy a property that can be used for personal and then for business, just like a truck, for example, if you buy a car and you use it for business, but you also use it for personal, then you are, you are allowed to depreciate it, but only based on the percentage of the business use. So for example, uh, let's assume that you use a, a truck for 50% uh, for business. 50% is for business and the other 50% is for your personal use. Then in that case, you will be allowed to claim a depreciation on the 50% of the cost of that truck or that car that you have. The other 50% is basically personal use, therefore it's not a deduction for the business. So keep in mind that any items that you have that it that is not hundred percent for the business, you are only allowed to deduct in this case depreciate only the portion that represent the use for the business. So what are some of the requirements uh, when we are talking about depreciation? What are some of the requirements that you have to have in order to depreciate an items? First of all, you have to own the property. The property has to be yours. That doesn't mean that um, you, know, you have to pay cash or check or money to acquire that property. It just means that the title is yours. So for example, sometimes you could buy a property, but you are financing the property with, with a loans or buying it uh, with a credit card and you haven't paid it yet. But because the title is yours, that means you own the property. So that is one of the requirements. So many people sometimes ask, what happens if I'm leasing or renting a asset, a property? Can I depreciate it? And normally what happens when you lease or rent a property is that that by itself is not considered to be a depreciable item. That means that you don't book it as an asset in your book, but actually what is going to happen is that every time you make a payment to that uh, property, basically, it's going to be an expense. So you don't need to book it directly as an asset, but every time you make the payment, either for renting the property or leasing the property, that payment is going to be considered to be an expense expense. So basically it's going to be a deduction 100% right away. So you don't need to do any kind of capitalization or anything like that. So every time that you are making a payment for an asset that is not yours, that will be considered to be an expense. So that is a good news. That is a good thing. So it's not a bad thing. You don't need to capitalize or depreciate any kind of items if it's not yours. Because normally whoever is the owner of that asset will be the one depreciating the asset, not the one that is making the payments. So the second one is that the, the second requirement is that the business have to use the asset or the property or the asset must be an income producing activity. What is the meaning of that? Basically, if you have like equipment, let's say for example, that you buy a car for yourself, for the business, 100%. That car is a business use. So therefore, you are going to be able to depreciate that car. Or, for example, if you buy you know, a real estate 
property that and you rent it, that normally it is an income producing activity. And then you are also allowed to depreciate it. So sometimes it could be mixed. Sometimes you can buy, for example, a car and you can be using it for business, but it's not producing income. Or you could be using the car to produce income because maybe the car generates some income for your business. Okay. So those are the two requirements um, in terms of depreciation. So the first one is on the property, and the second one is either business use or income producing. The third one, the third one is that it has to, you have to be able to uh, assign a useful life. What is the meaning of useful life? Every property uh, that you have that is for business, it has to have a life. If the property only have a one year life, then you don't depreciate it. You are just gonna deduct it as an expense. But if the property has more than one year life, then you must be able to know what is the useful life of that property. Some property could be lasting you know, many years. Sometimes it could be three years, five years, seven years, 27 years, 30, 50 years. But as long as the property lasts that more than one year, and if you are able to assign a useful life, then that property can be depreciated. And just like I mentioned before, the last one is basically it has to be more than one year. If you have an asset, like I say, less than one year, then that asset uh, is just going to be an expense. Um, you don't need to depreciate an item that doesn't last that long. Um, it's only for those that last more than one year. So I'm going to repeat again. The requirements are very simple. You have to be the owner of that property. That is the first requirement. The second requirement is that the property has to be used for the business or have to produce income. And this income that the property has to produce has to be taxable income. Okay. The third requirement is that you have to be able to assign a useful life. And the last one is that this asset must last more than one year. Um, so those are the four requirements in order for you to depreciate any kind of item. So what information, let's say that you qualify for this depreciation and what are some of the requirements that you need to have in order to compute the calculation? Because remember depreciation is that it's basically a reduction over time of the asset that you have. So in order to calculate or compute this depreciation, you need to know four things. The first one is the basis. The second one is the life. The third one is the place in service. And the last one is the method of depreciation. And we are gonna discuss into more detail what is the meaning of all of this because sometimes you might be confused with basis. That is a technical term, uh, either in accounting or in taxes. So what is a basis? Basis is your investment in property for tax purpose is a value. And this value could represent sometimes the cost that you acquire the, the property. So for example, um, you know, if you went and buy a building, what is the basis of that building. The basis of that building is the cost of that building. So for example, if you went and buy uh, you know, one, uh, $1 million building, so that $1 million building is your basis. Sometimes there is a confusion between uh, what represent the, the basis of the building, because sometimes you can buy the building and then there is uh, other costs. Associated, associated with that building. For example, um, it could be a settlement cost or closing cost. Should that be an expense or that should be depreciated as part of your basis for the building? And technically speaking, the law say that those costs 
are part of the basis of the building. So if you have registration fee, um, if you have lawyer fee related to this real estate that you are buying, those will be part of your basis of the building. So the basis of your building can change over time. After the first year, your basis of the building is going to be adjusted. And in taxes, we call it adjusted basis. What is your adjusted basis? Your adjusted basis is basically the change, either an increase or a decrease of the value of that building. So what is an increase? The increase is when you make improvement. So for example, you change um, the whole roof of that building. Then that is an improvement and that will be capitalized, uh, depreciated, but that will be added as part of your basis for that building. So what is a reduction or a decrease in the basis of the building? It happens when you have um, depreciation. So the depreciation reduces your basis. Or if you have like a loss, like a, you know, maybe there was a flood and then you lost. Uh, some of the part of the building got damages and you have a loss. And that decreased your value of the building. So those are a term that you need to understand because like I say, basis, when you buy it, it's very simple because it's basically the cost that you have. But sometime through the year, you are going to have uh, changes in that basis. There is nothing that you need to do, but it only has a value at the time that you are trying to sell the property. So for example, if today you buy that building that we were mentioning earlier today for, for a million dollars, and then you make um, you know, the roof, you change it, and it costs you 100000 Then your basis on that building is going to be $1.1 million. So that means in the future, when you sell it, so for example, if next year you decide to sell it, and then you have $50,000 depreciation, then your basis is going to be your $1.1 minus $50,000. That will be your adjusted basis. So if you try to sell it above that adjusted basis, that means you have a gain and that will be a taxable income in your tax return. Class life. Remember when we were talking earlier, saying that you have to be able to assign a useful life to that property. So this concept come into place here, class life. So normally the government assigns you a life um, of the property that you need to depreciate. The tax law has defined certain specific uh, asset to be uh, in some specific years. So what I mean by that is that, for example, if you buy equipment, all equipment has a life of five years. So you cannot change it to be three years. You cannot change it to be seven years. So it's going to be five years. Furniture and fixture, that one has a life of seven years. Um, real estate, if you have residential real estate, that one has a life of 27.5 years. But if you have a commercial property, that one has a life of 39 years. And remember that when you are dealing with real estate properties, remember the land is not depreciable. So only the building itself, the structure attached to the land are the only one that you can deduct or depreciate as an expense. But those, the land itself cannot be. Place in service. Placing service means that when you acquire an asset, if the asset that you acquire is not in service, then you cannot start depreciating the asset. So for example, let's say today is December and I'm gonna buy a computer. 
and I place my order and then I receive it next year, January. If that is the case, this year, even though I paid it, I bought the computer, I paid with cash, but I didn't get it delivered and I didn't get to use it until next year, that means that when I start doing my calculation of my depreciation amount, that will be next year, not this year. Because this year, even though I, I bought it, I didn't use it. So because I didn't use it, then I cannot depreciate it. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's very important to know because that happened very often with real estate. If you buy a property, like a real estate, and you are doing renovation and fixing and you are making all kinds of improvement, but the property was not ready for you to rent it and it wasn't available for renting, that means that you cannot take depreciation because you are not placing that property in service yet. When you place the property in service, it is at that time when you are, you are going to start calculating depreciation. Keep that in mind. It's only when the property is placed in service. So what are the methods of depreciation? There are two most famous methods. One is the straight line, and that is the easiest one. But internal taxes, that is the one that will give you the less benefits. So basically, the straight line is that you take an asset and you divide it by the life of the asset. The other one, which is the most common use, and many, many people know about this one, uh, is the modify depreciation method. It's a mark. It's a M-A-C-R-S, which stands for Modify Accelerated Cost Recovering System. So normally what happens with this method of depreciation is that this one is accelerated, which means that at the beginning of the year, you are going to take the most depreciation than the, than the last part of the year. So it's not equal. So it, it, the depreciation is heavily weighted at the beginning of the year than the, you know, the last couple of years. So at the beginning, you're going to have more depreciation than the last couple of years uh, versus the straight line, which basically is just straight line. It's just the same every year. Um, so this method of depreciation, uh, you know, every asset that you have is going to have a method of depreciation and it's going to have a life. So you could be buying equipment, like I say, and that equipment, you could be using the, uh, accelerated method of depreciation, which is going to give you the most benefit for your taxes because it's going to be a bigger deduction. And when that happens, you are going to see a less taxable income because you, because you are taking a bigger deduction for that year. So keep in mind that there are four items that you need to know to come up with a depreciation calculation. One is your basis. What is your cost? Which is normally for most of the people is the cost. So what is your cost is your basis. The second one is to know what is the life. Is that five years? Is that seven years? Is that a 27.5? Is that 39 years? Or there is an infinite life, which means that it cannot be depreciated. And when the property was in service, at that time, when you know when the property was in service, then at that time is when you're going to start calculating your depreciation. And the last one is your method of depreciation. What are you going to use? Are you going to be using the straight line? Are you gonna using? Are you gonna be using the mark, the accelerated depreciation, or which method you are gonna use? So with all of these, we know that internal taxes. There is always limitation. So, do we have any limitation when we are talking about depreciation? And the answer is that overall there is no limitation, uh, which means that you know. If you have millions of items, property, you can depreciate those unless you are using an a special item or a special method. What I mean by that, the listed property, 
listed property has an annual deduction limit. So if you're asking yourself, what is a listed property? You never heard of listed property. So if you never heard of listed, listed property, then listed property is a term that is used in taxes to refer to a asset that is combined business and personal. So for example, you can have a computer, which technically it could be used for personal or it could be used for a business. You could be, uh, it could be like your cell phone. It could be a car. It could be a truck. Some truck can be used for business and also can be used for personal. So those are considered to be a listed properties and those have a special limitation. But besides those limitation of those listed property, if you have something that can only be used 100% for business, there's no limitation. I mean, whatever amount that you have that need to be depreciated, then you are allowed to depreciate it. However, here, if you are looking at my slides here, I have two items. One is a section 179. And the other one is called bonus depreciation. Those two have limitation. Technically speaking, one section 179 is not really a depreciation, but is a deduction of the asset. Um, that is kind of like an exception to the rule, which technically I allow you to deduct 100% of an asset that you buy. However, it has some limitation. Uh, bonus depreciation also have a little bit of uh, limitation, but let's discuss first about the section 179 deduction. So what is the limitation? The first limitation, and this one changed every year, but the first limitation is that the most you can take in a year for a section 179 is 1,080,000. So that means that, for example, if you're buying an... I don't know, let's say that you buy a property that has a value and that property can be depreciated 100%. It could be equipment, it could be machine. So let's assume that you bought that equipment for 1.2 million. That means that the most you can deduct as a section 179, is that 1 million 80 because you cannot take more than that. So it has a dollar limitation and that dollar limitation is 1 million 80,000. And like I say, it changed every year. So if you are going back, then it's gonna be less in the future, more likely than not, it's gonna be a little bit higher. And the other limitation that it has is that if you purchase in a year, more than $2.7 million in assets, and you're gonna try to use this section 179, then the section 179 is gonna be facing out. So that means the amount above that 2.7, it will reduce your amount of the section 179. And the last one, the last limitation, it is that, um, you cannot create a loss with a section 179. You cannot reduce this amount by the amount of loss. You cannot create a loss pretty much. So it has a basically an income net profit limitation. In order for you to use the section 179, you have to have a profit. If you don't have it, and you try to use it, then some of this amount is going to be carried forward. But you cannot create a loss with a sec section 179. However, bonus depreciation doesn't have this kind of limitation. Bonus depreciation allows you to create a loss. So there is no dollar limitation and also doesn't have a profit limitation. So in a way, if you have these limitations, uh, bonus depreciation might be the option that you can select. 
So if we have these two items, section 179 and bonus depreciation, which technically almost in theory, well, not really in theory, but it could be confusing because it sounded like almost the same. If I buy an item and then I do a section 179, maybe I can take 100% uh, as a deduction of the items. Or if I'm doing a bonus depreciation that in 2022 is 100% deduction. So I will be almost accomplishing the same. Either I take the section 179 or the bonus depreciation. So one of the difference between these two is that section 179 is a dollar. Okay. So it's a dollar deduction. And the calculation is based on a dollar amount. Remember what I say. D has a limit, and the limit is one point uh, one million eighty thousand. The bonus depreciation is a percentage of the cost. So for twenty twenty two, that means that if you place an asset for business use before December thirty first, twenty twenty two, and after September twenty seven, two thousand seventeen. That asset can be depreciated 100% as a business deduction. But after January 1st, 2023, which means this year, any asset that you place in business for business use, and you are trying to use the bonus depreciation, you are only allowed to deduct 80% as a bonus depreciation. You cannot do 100%. It has to be 80%. So it has a small difference starting in 2023. And one of the biggest difference between these two is the estate. Because almost all estate allow you to take a section 179, which means that if you are taking a section 179 at the federal level, then most of the estate will also allow you to take a section 179 at the estate level, but only few, and if I remember correctly, is less than 20 uh, estate allow you to take the same deduction uh, for bonus depreciation. So you can have an impact where you might be making a loss if you are taking a bonus depreciation at the federal level, but then when you are dealing with the estate level, then you have to pay taxes because the estate do not allow you to take this bonus depreciation. So that is a, one of the biggest difference between these two. And that is when you have to decide if you are going to take a section 179 deduction or you are going to take a bonus depreciation. And like I say, 2023 bonus depreciation is only 80%. And this number is going to start decreasing 20% per year which means that by the year 2027, unless we have a change in the law, this bonus depreciation is going to be equal to zero because 2023 is 80%. 2024 is going to be 60%. 2025 is going to be 40%. And 2026 is only 20%. And like I said, 2027 is 0%. So you won't be allowed to take a bonus depreciation anymore but you will be still allowed to take the section 179 if the law allow you to do so. And lastly, how do you claim all of these bonus depreciation section 179 or your regular depreciation? Very simple. You only need to complete the form 4562 and then attach it to your tax return. That's all you need to do. Obviously, the calculation, the information, and all of that is going to be including your tax return. But internal calculation, you are going to use the form 4562. Okay, so that will be all for today. And if you have any kind of questions, and then please feel free to contact us. And you have here our website, which is www.communitycpa.com. Or if you prefer, you can send an email to catering at communitycpa.com or give us a phone call at 515-288-3188.
And even though the area code is in Iowa, because our headquarters is located in Des Moines, Iowa, we have office in Iowa City. We also have office in Minnesota, but we work with everybody around the state. So if you are not in Iowa or Minnesota and you want to contact us, feel free to do so. So again, you got catering at communitycpa.com or our phone number is 515-288-3188. And we are open Monday through Saturday, six day a week from 8.30 to 5.30. So if you have any question, feel free to contact us. Thank you. And we will see you again.